So let's start. Uh, I'm Patrick Clausen. I'm the Director of Research here at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and thank you for joining uh, today's Policy Forum. Uh, please uh, mute your mic and uh, mute your audio. Um, if you uh, would like to ask a que uh, question, uh, then uh, please uh, go to the upper right-hand corner, and you'll see there's uh, four boxes. The uh, second one to the left is entitled Chat, and if you click on Chat, uh, then you'll notice down in there there's a uh, two boxes underneath it. One says everyone and one says direct messages. If you click on direct messages, you can send me a message uh, with your question, uh, and uh, I'll pose it to uh, our, our presenters uh, once the presentation is over. Um, um, so um, with that, let's get started. Um, today's uh, session, we have uh, four uh, speakers. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, Amir Afkami. Uh, Amir is a medical doctor who is the preclinical director at the George Washington University School of Medicine. We kind of got garbled a bit in our uh, invite, uh, his title. And he also has a PhD uh, his, in history from Yale, uh, where he wrote a, a wonderful book entitled a Modern Contagion, which is about cholera epidemics uh, in Iran. And he uh, served in government, including on the legislative staff of Senator Stabenow and with the State Department's uh, Iraq Mental Health Initiative. And so Amir will start us off uh, by reviewing the state of the COVID virus uh, situation uh, in Iran. Um. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, the Washington Institute, for having me here today. Um, let me begin by saying that at a combination of economic, political, and ideological motives are responsible for the rapid and large-scale COVID-19 outbreak in Iran since the disease was first declared to be present on the country's soil on February 19th. Um, the pandemic was predictable because of China's status as Iran's principal commercial partner, but it is largely agreed that Iran's inadequate pre um, precautionary measures to restrict and monitor travelers from China ensured that the disease would make landfall and uh, ensured that the disease made landfall and spread in Iran much more quickly than any other country in the Middle East. Um, this is most evident um, in, in, in terms of the shortage of domestically produced face masks and personal protective equipment as late as early February uh, due to Tehran's unwillingness to restrict Iranian exports to China. And the, what I see as the authorities' bewildering opposition to travel, uh, significant travel restrictions and, and, and quarantines for fear of further harming uh, the economy. Um, the, uh, there, in all likelihood, politics also played a role uh, in minimizing the leadership's public health response uh, due to the fact that he wanted to ensure a large turnout for the country's parliamentary elections, which uh, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei had built as a religious duty. This was going to be a litmus test uh, for Ali Khamenei and the government in Iran in the wake of the scandal of the Ukrainian airline downing and the numerous protests that the country had faced in November. Now, um, I would argue that the securitization and the militarization of Iran's public health in the last month, which Mehdi Khaleji has written about extensively, and he can talk to in more detail, probably contributed to the worsening of the pandemic uh, because of the fear and lack of accountability and a state of paranoia uh, that ended up dominating uh, some of the policy measures in the government, um, uh, including which some of which sort of bore fruit uh, uh, with the rejection of aid from the from international groups. Uh, as, as such as Doctors Without Borders, who were act, asked to leave the country last week. All of this to say that the country, as of Sunday, officially 
uh, stands at about uh, over 70,000 infected and uh, about 4,500 now dead because of COVID-19. Now, President Hassan Rouhani claims that Iran has flattened the curve and actually yesterday stated that because of the descent in the number of deaths and de uh, daily deaths or, or weekly deaths in Iran, Iran is actually performing better than Western Europe vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, in terms of its uh, public health policies and prevention policies uh, towards COVID-19. I, I, I'm very skeptical of these figures. Um, conservative models from the University of South Wales in Australia and MIT Virginia Tech model uh, actually point to a higher proportion infected with the, actually the peak of the infections happening uh, in the summer, probably more towards July and August. And even if we take the government's own figures at face value. Between the 19th and 4th of April, uh, the number of coronavirus fatalities officially stood at, at about 3,500, and the numbers who tested positive were, were over 55,000. Now, this is where it gets interesting, and the devil is in the de detail. The number of individuals who died of an acute respiratory syndrome, or hot de tanafosi, was over 13,000 in Iran, and there were over 178,000 individuals reported with acute respiratory syndrome, okay? On a typical month last year, even at its height, there were about six per 100,000 individuals with acute respiratory syndrome, uh, which sort of added up to about 4,800 individuals. So suddenly, we have unidentified acute respiratory syndrome uh, numbering about 178,000 in the country. Uh, now, this obviously points to inadequate testing and a government unwilling to consider that any of this sort of peak in numbers of acute respiratory this, uh, syndromes are, are due to COVID-19, at least officially. Uh, and if you take a close look and calculate even um, even, even conservatively, based on the numbers of acute respiratory syndrome, I'll be happy to get into sort of the details of the calculation. Um, you know, we're looking at about a half a million individuals infected with COVID-19, sort of far larger than what the government is reporting. And I have to say that even individuals within the Islamic Republic's coronavirus task force have stated as much. Uh, Hamid Suri, a member of the task force, uh, about a week ago got into a lot of trouble because he maintained that he believes, again, based on official numbers and based on, uh, on all of these acute respiratory uh, syndromes that are being reported, that, that, that about half a million individuals have this disease. Uh, so, so I think we're really looking at the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the growth of COVID-19 in Iran. Iran is not out of uh, the... Um, um, uh, sort of upward slope curve yet, and and uh, we can foresee that this will have an incredible amount of pressure in the coming months on Iran's healthcare sector, particularly uh, Iran's um, intensive care unit beds, which number around 2,500. And, and, and you know, when we're looking at hundreds of thousands of individuals with acute respiratory uh, distress and due to COVID-19, uh, who will need help or who already need help and need supportive treatment to survive this, Iran does not have the capabilities without outside assistance to meet these needs. And, and, and the securitization of Iran's public health policy is really doing a disservice to this. I'll stop here and hand it to my colleagues. Thank you so much. And so now let's turn to uh, the Institute's uh, own Mithi Khalaji. Uh, Mithi studied in theological seminaries for 14 years in Qom, and he's been a close watcher of uh, Iranian politics and uh, has written uh, several in insightful pieces on our website about the uh, impact that COVID-19 is having on Iranian politics, and hopefully we'll have another piece from him tomorrow. But right now, let me turn it over to Mithi. Thank you. Um, as you know, the uh, pandemic breakout started in um, Qom um, and reportedly uh, through um, uh, Chinese seminarians. Uh, 
So uh, the uh, coronavirus um, uh, made people learn about uh, the um, clerical establishment uh, uh, being so globalized that um, it hosts many um, uh, foreign students, especially from China. So according to um, officials from the um, health uh, ministry, uh, more than 700 Chinese um, uh, citizen uh, uh, live in Qom and study in, in the uh, seminary. Anyway, um, the fact that the uh, coronavirus breakout started from Qom um, has created lots of problem, not only for the government, um, as mentioned by uh, Amir, but also for clergy, because um, clergy did not want to um, listen to uh, the um, uh, health um, officials uh, uh, in uh, preventing and taking uh, necessary measures in prevention of the uh, for prevention of the virus. So, uh, for example, the <clears throat> clergy has resisted the uh, closure of the shrine of Masume in Qom for a um, few weeks. And all this um, has affected the image of clergy in Iran. So um, as many other pandemics in the history, this uh, struggle between uh, science and religion was one of the implication of the uh, pandemic in Iran and has contributed in uh, damaging further the image of the clergy, um, the Shia clergy. So, <clears throat> uh, on the other hand, it showed that the clergy has very little uh, influence in uh, shaping the government's policies uh, with regard to many important issues. Uh, including the um, uh, health policy uh, of the regime. Um, the other implication of the <clears throat> virus was the fact that <clears throat> um, the, the Iranian society was suffering from uh, the um, psychological pressure that has been put on the civil society, uh, especially after the uh, protest in November 2019. So um, there was a little uh, motivation in civil society to get uh, organized and react to government's um, um, uh, pressure and su suppression. Um, the coronavirus and uh, the uh, its consequences, including uh, the, the government's policy to um, uh, ask people for um, social distance, has um, increased um, the um, civil society's weakness and uh, has separated from people from each other and has uh, reduced uh, the um, uh, resistance capability of people um, uh, against uh, uh, various um, pressure coming from the government. So um, uh, the government was, you know, until two, three, four months ago, uh, the government was afraid of um, seeing uh, more protests coming uh, as a result of um, economic hardship that people are suffering from. But now it seems that at least government is confident that in near future, there will not be any um, social movement or any um, significant uh, uh, protest uh, against um, anything. <coughs> and another implication was <clears throat> uh, the fact that since the very beginning, um, IRGC started to get involved in <clears throat> And the campaign um, against the um, um, uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, let me uh, emphasize that the Revolutionary Guard has started to get involved in the uh, 
um, uh, health system since Iran-Iraq war. So uh, they have um, lots of advantages, um, exclusive advantages to um, uh, build up um, health facilities, um, import um, uh, medical equipment, and uh, have control over a significant portion of the health system in Iran. So it's not something new. Uh, the best hospitals in Iran, many of them belong to the revolutionary guard, like Baqiyat Allah in Tehran, and uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib in Qom, and uh, um, uh, uh, a great number of uh, uh, doctors, good doctors, um, and uh, medical staff worked for revolutionary guard. <clears throat> so it was natural to see that after <clears throat> uh, the pandemic, um, um, Revolutionary Guard wanted to uh, take control over this issue, and they started to uh, officially uh, get involved a few days after uh, the government announced the uh, um, uh, pandemic, uh, the virus uh, breakout in Iran, uh, and Khamenei ordered uh, uh, the armed forces to create a um, um, medical base for uh, fighting against the uh, virus. And he said that this might be a uh, um, uh, bioterror. So uh, by um, securitizing the um, uh, virus, the government has uh, uh, succeeded to securitize the health system to a very large extent. And this has uh, generated um, uh, uh, a very significant struggle between the health system and military. <clears throat> there was lots of fight between Ministry of Health and Revolutionary Guard, and, um, be, or in other uh, words, between uh, Rouhani and Ayatollah Khamenei over um, how to um, um, coordinate uh, in um, fighting um, against the virus. And finally, Revolutionary Guard won this um, fight. Um, still, you see some reaction from um, some officials who criticize Revolutionary Guard's um, large uh, involvement in, in the matter. For example, today there was <clears throat> the head of um, uh, 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 the, uh, one of the committees in, in Majlis, a very important MP, said that uh, the government should stop militarizing the health system and let the, um, uh, the civil uh, health system uh, deal with the uh, crisis. And um, I think this um, militarization and securitization of the health system uh, would not affect only the the, uh, uh, the medical arena uh, or the health arena, but also it would affect the other uh, um, uh, field, and uh, the, it would contribute in militarization of the entire government, and would legitimize the the uh, uh, revolutionary guards uh, decision to act beyond. Uh, the Constitution and uh, the uh, country's law. Um, and I think it would be very easy for uh, the Revolutionary Guard from now on to interfere in many other uh, policies of the government, especially it would um, uh, decrease the uh, significance of the democratic institution, uh, especially the upcoming majlis, which is largely uh, under control of the Revolutionary Guard. I stop here. Well, thank you very much. And so uh, now we turn to me. Uh, I'm Patrick Clausen. I'm the Director of Research here, and I'm uh, by training an economist and have written a number of books about Iran. Uh, and I want to say a few words about the economic impact that uh, COVID-19 is having on Iran. Uh, Iran is emerging out of a recession. Uh, the, the Central Statistical in Institute says that uh, the non-oil economy 
uh, has actually started to grow at the end of 2019, and the central bank is even more optimistic about its rate of growth. Uh, and unemployment is reported to have fallen. Now, fell 1.7 percentage points, it's still 10.6, so it's uh, still very high. Uh, and this coming out of the recession was uh, primarily due to an extraordinarily uh, expansionary fiscal and monetary stance that the Iranian government has taken. Uh, we don't have good numbers about Iranian government spending. I don't believe a word of what they report uh, because we we know from what they've acknowledged about uh, their shortcomings in the past that their data are on uh, government spending are completely unreliable. But what we do know is that uh, they are running such a, a an enormous budget deficit and such a, a, a stimulatory monetary policy uh, that inflation uh, the consumer price index last, this last year, uh, ending in March, uh, was 34.8%. Uh, now, that's just under Rouhani's target of 35%, but just think about that. A government announcing its target was to keep inflation at 35% a year. Um, and um, the... Uh, this is going to make it hard for the Iranian government to stimula stimulate the economy more. Now, uh, the reality is that Iran's government has uh, excellent technical mechanisms for uh, providing relief to ordinary Iranians if they want to. Uh, because of a program that Iran instituted uh, more than a dozen years ago of direct payments to every family in Iran, uh, Iran um, can easily uh, change the amount that it's paying families and provide more relief to individuals. Um, and Iran also has got uh, from a, the program that it set up more than a uh, half dozen years ago, a way of, of uh, directing payments, cash payments, to, uh, to um, most of the poor people in the country. Uh, so from a technical point of view, Iran is much better off than most developing countries in having a way to distribute money if it wanted to. Uh, but they just don't have the resources to do that. Uh, and so Iran's in a very tight situation for providing more stimulus uh, when they're already uh, running uh, such a huge bunch of deficits. The uh, head of the Iran Economic Association, Parviz Javad, was quoted in the press uh, today as saying that, quote, the support the government is planning to lend to business is insignificant. Uh, and, and that's even though the, what the government has announced is a program for uh, 750 trillion rials in assistance, uh, that's about 5 billion U.S. dollars at the free market exchange rate. Um, and uh, just to put that into perspective, uh, that's more than half of the tax revenue that Iran collected last year. So uh, that's, the signif that's the aid uh, which the head of the Iran Economics Association is calling uh, insignificant, and I think he's basically right. Um, Iran has asked for more resources from the IMF. It's asked for a loan. Now, in theory, the loans from the IMF are supposed to be for balance of payments purposes. They're not supposed to be to support government spending, uh, like aid to the poor and, and health expenditures. Uh, but frankly, mm, governments t typically don't pay much attention to that, and, and especially in developing countries. And um, I assume that the uh, in Iran that uh, the government would find a way to indirectly borrow the money from the central bank and and, and to use it for government spending. Uh, the Iran's request from the IMF is pure political theater. Uh, the fact is that Iran could today, as we now speak, uh, draw down $2.1 billion from the IMF uh, because it has what's called a reserve tranche and it has what are called special drawing rights or SDR holdings. So Iran could just simply send a telex to the fund and get $2.1 billion this afternoon. But they haven't done that. And instead, they've made this request for a, a loan from the fund through a facility the fund has set up. And then it said, ah, oh, the United States shouldn't veto this, which again is political theater, because the fact of the matter is that uh, the United States does not have a veto at the IMF on loans. Uh, the United States quite often opposes loans at the, uh, at the IMF board. Uh, the Treasury Department sends a report to Congress every three months about how it's voted on loans at the IMF. And if you look those up, you'll discover that uh, last year the U.S. opposed a loan to the Republic of Congo in July 2019 and opposed a loan to Mauritania in May 2019. And in both cases, those loans were approved. 
So if the IMS managing director presents the Iran loan to the board, the United States can uh, object, as it often does, uh, but it will have no impact and the loan will go through. Uh, so uh, all this talk about the United States having a veto is, is just, as I say, political theater. Um, the U.S., by the way, uh, objects to these loans on uh, economic grounds, and the objection to the Iran loan would indeed be because the United States doesn't believe that Iran meets the criteria of the loan, uh, namely that the money would actually be spent uh, on uh, combating the virus and offsetting its effects, because the U.S. is suspicious from Iran's track record of uh, um, money going to pharmaceutical companies ended up uh, being used to support terrorism and um, money for the going to the health ministry ended up being diverted to corruption. So um, let me just close by saying, what do I expect the impact of the, the uh, COVID-19 to be on Iran's economy? Uh, the respected Iranian economist uh, Saeed Leilaz estimates it'll be about a 2 to 3% drop in GDP uh, this year. I think it's a little low, but not that high, uh, because Iran has decided that it will not shut down uh, the economy, but instead allow things to function. Uh, they are prepared to accept a lot more deaths than we would in the United States, and so they're not going to close the economy. In fact, already uh, non-essential businesses outside of Tehran have been allowed to open, and uh, next week the non-essential businesses in Tehran will be allowed to open. Um, government workers, two-thirds of the government workers in each office have been told to show up for work and only one-third staying out. Um, so the impact of the virus will be felt particularly by uh, the service sector in urban areas, uh, and that's some of the poorest people in Iran. So we're talking about street vendors, people who run small shops. Uh, they're going to be hit the hardest, um, uh, but uh, the overall economy is not going to suffer um, that greatly because Iran will accept a lot of deaths instead. And with that, let me turn it over to Kate. So uh, Catherine Bauer is at uh, the Washington Institute. Uh, she joined us from the Treasury Department, uh, where she was working on, um, among other things, uh, Iran sanction issues. And she's written extensively about sanctions matters, and that I believe is what she's going to be talking to us about today. Thank you, Patrick. Um, just want to make sure everyone can hear me OK. Patrick, can you give me a thumbs up? Great. Thank you. Um, Okay, so I'm going to discuss just briefly some of the sanctions issues, and uh, this is an issue that's gotten a lot of attention over the last several weeks. Um, I think it's understandable to look at the alarming situation in Iran, both the development of the crisis within Iran and the spread of the coronavirus from Iran, and um, that the instinct would be to look for ways to assist here and in other places experiencing this um, crisis. Um, and in this context, Iranian officials joined by a growing chorus have pointed to U.S. sanctions as one of the key obstacles to an effective response. Um, so this has led to a, to a call for U.S. action on this front. I think it's important at the beginning kind of to distinguish uh, between these calls for sanctions relief or an easing of U.S. sanctions and calls for a more effective implementation of, of existing exemptions. And I think there's been kind of a growing consensus around what um, the U.S. administration, the Trump administration could do in the latter context um, without fundamentally altering the, the architecture of the U.S. sanctions um, on Iran in order to be able to uh, aid and or assist in the humanitarian response. And those are things such as providing greater clarity on allowable humanitarian trade, um, considering expanding um, dollar caps on uh, how much NGOs can spend or send to support their work in Iran, and looking at other time-limited authorizations that could support things such as technical exchange of, a, of knowledge and materiel that um, would support Iran rolling out, developing medical interventions, and ultimately fielding a vaccine when it's available. So I'm just going to, to, um, to touch on a couple of, of, of somewhat technical issues to inform the discussion, but very briefly so that we can get to the Q&A. First of all, um, it's important to point out that Iran does have access to funds um, abroad to support its purchase of, of, of humanitarian supplies, including medicine and medical devices. Iran does not need the emergency loans that Patrick talked about or resumption of oil trade waivers to finance humanitarian purchases. And this is I think there's a distinction here as well to be made between the public health response and the needs of the public health sector um, versus the economic stimulus. 
um, that Iranian officials have have articulated in terms of um, increasing, you know, direct cash payments, unemployment benefits, uh, other economic other economic stimulus. So they do have the funds abroad, and they do have access to those funds. Um, I think that there's some confusion here because there was a period when they did not. Um, even though the U.S. designation of the Central Bank of Iran in September 2019 under counterterrorism authorities effectively barred the Central Bank from the involvement in such trade, the Office of Foreign Asset Control quietly issued a license in early March to reverse that ban. This allows Iran to use funds in CBI accounts abroad, um, which could hold as much as $90 billion, according to the Congressional Research Service, for this narrow purchase this narrow purpose of purchasing medical supplies and other allowable goods. In fact, just last Thursday, the South Korean government announced that it had resumed humanitarian trade with Iran as of April 6th under this new OFAC license. Um, there are, of course, other mechanisms to support uh, humanitarian trade with Iran. We probably all heard about the Swiss Channel, um, which was uh, established through a humanitarian framework that the administration rolled out in October 2019 to assist foreign governments and financial institutions in establishing payment mechanisms to facilitate humanitarian trade. So um, what this did is it, it, it allowed, it provided um, a series of procedures related to due diligence um, that banks operating in such a channel would have to abide by in order to get comfort um, from the U.S. government, the U.S. Treasury in particular, that their transactions would not be subjected to sanctions. Um, this mechanism, however, is not without criticism. Banks have complained that the due diligence required is onerous, if not prohibitive, of such trade. Um, but nonetheless, the Swiss did uh, submit to establishing such uh, a mechanism, and this was inaugurated in late February. Um, it was in part, the humanitarian procedures were in part designed to get around this restriction on working with the central bank um, during the period from its designation under counterterrorism authorities until this license was issued recently. And this is entirely uh, voluntary. So what you see is the South Koreans deciding to use, uh, to operate under the license that was being made available in March, but also talking about establishing their own humanitarian framework. And so if it's voluntary, why would they do that? And this gets me to my second point, which is that despite the technical changes that should make it easier for Iran to access its offshore accounts and the existence of these mechanisms designed specifically to ensure that humanitarian supplies can reach the Iranian people, that financial institutions continue to be deterred um, from working with Iran based on the fear of U.S. sanctions. Um, and this is, I think you only need to look at the overwhelming response um, from both firms and financial institutions in Europe in particular when the U.S. reimposed unilateral sanctions um, to see that, uh, that they do really provide it, serve as a deterrent to, to, to working um, with Iranians. Um, the U.S., as we've heard from the State Department and Treasury Department repeatedly, does maintain broad exemptions for the sale of medicine medical devices as well as food and agricultural commodities um, under these humanitarian waivers. Now, they do specifically include um, items such as personal protective equipment and ventilators, um, as well as authorizations for NGOs to provide relief services and transfer funds into Iran to support those operations. Nonetheless, there is widespread confusion and concern um, about running afoul of U.S. sanctions, and this stymies these activities. So generally, the most significant obstacle is foreign banks who uh, who have are concerned about run afoul, running afoul of um, who are inclined to avoid these trans these transactions out of abundance of caution. So finally, what can the administration do? First, uh, the administration could signal that it has no intention of blocking firms and financial institutions from working with Iran to address COVID-19 related humanitarian needs. Um, this would be, from a public diplomacy standpoint, um, a demonstration of goodwill to the Iranian people, separate from the administration's policy of regime behavior change. Um, but it also, what commercial firms would likely need is something in writing from OFAC, and this is what financial institutions are going to look for in particular. So it would not be unprecedented for the Treasury Department and OFAC in particular to issue 
a new license that would consolidate the existing authorizations and provide clarity that such authorizations apply in the current crisis. So, for example, um, some of the previous authorizations, which were uh, initially extended as time limited in response to, um, to, to earthquakes, the BAM earthquake in 2002 and other earthquakes in 2012 in Iran, cover apply to disaster relief in particular. And so a statement from OFAC that says that, that those authorizations for NGO, NGOs to send money also apply in, in not just for uh, natural disasters, but for the current crisis would be helpful. Um, as part of this clarification, the, the Treasury should make clear that these funds, um, central bank funds, are accessible now. And in particular, the escrow funds. These are uh, the funds that were locked up in Iran's oil importing um, countries after the waiver policy for oil trade was discontinued. Um, some of those banks did continue to allow Iran uh, to, to use those funds for humanitarian purposes, as was allowed prior to the central bank designation. Um, and as South Korea, South Korea has announced they're doing, they can resume that now. Um, and finally, to consider uh, in, in consultation with experts, consider other authorizations. In particular, as I mentioned previously, um, ensuring that there is the ability to have a technical exchange of knowledge and of the kind of material necessary to make sure that Iran can implement these developing medical interventions um, and a vaccine. So I think in short, the point is that if the existing authorizations for humanitarian trade were being effectively implemented, there wouldn't be a need for, for a mechanism such as this special humanitarian framework. Um, but indeed, there clearly are things um, that, that can be done to reassure financial institutions um, that they can uh, legally and without fear of ensuing U.S. sanctions participate in this kind of trade. That's not to say that this is business, that these are transactions that were without risk, um, but to say that there are uh, financial institutions that have participated in this activity in the past that have due diligence measures in place that can make them, uh, that can mitigate that risk. Clarifying which and how exemptions apply to the current crisis also would be in line with um, the administration policy that has already promoted the humanitarian frameworks and this license that was extended um, to allow central bank, uh, the Central Bank of Iran to be involved in humanitarian trade. Um, so, and these would also be continuing on from actions taken under you know, previous administrations, including Bush and Obama administrations to help facilitate um, the rapid deployment of assistance um, to Iran and other places when there is a crisis. Um, so I think with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Patrick to, to open up for questions. Thank you. Great. So we got some interesting questions in. Let's start with one for Amir. Um, is it possible to provide um, assistance to Iran to counter COVID-19 without that assistance uh, going through the IRGC? Um, I've maintained that we need to be ahead of the curve with Iran when it comes to assistance. And one area where we can be ahead of the curve and really minimize the chances of the assistance going towards more nefarious ends is technical assistance. Uh, this is a rapidly evolving environment uh, when we're talking about COVID-19, its control, its diagnosis, and its treatment. Um, we're looking forward to significant improvements in the speed of diagnosis. We are looking at antimicrobials in the pipeline as early as the coming months and in the coming year, um, vaccination year plus. All of these are uh, significant technical leaps that unfortunately Iran is deprived of partly because of the barriers uh, between um, multi-American companies uh, to engage with their Iranian counterparts, including Iranians in the civilian sector and in the healthcare sector, but also the result of the prevailing paranoia within the security infrastructure in the Supreme Leader's office. Most famously, the Supreme Leader rejected outright any collaboration 
on vaccines with the United States two weeks ago, arguing that that's actually a um, uh, underhanded way for the United St States to further spread what he believes is a biological weapon within Iran. So, but but nevertheless, uh, we we still have a room to bypass Iranian authorities by engaging directly with the Iranian healthcare sector, including within um, the private um, entities within the healthcare sector, as uh, we are learning uh, more about this virus and ways to prevent it in the coming months to years. Thank you. And now, Mehdi, a question for you. Um, Supreme Leader Khamenei is not young. Uh, he would seem to be in the population group that's very vulnerable to the, this virus. What would happen if he dies? Um, given the fact that the um, system has been um, largely uh, securitized um, and Revolutionary Guard has uh, physically control over um, uh, uh, the important cities uh, in Iran, um, I think um, um, the Revolutionary Guard would play the most significant role in the succession process. Uh, and I don't believe that um, the clergy or uh, assembly of experts, which is constitutionally in charge of appointing a new uh, leader, would have that much uh, uh, influence in shaping the future leadership. Um, uh, the whole thing depends on uh, a revolutionary guards, different factions' uh, uh, ability uh, to uh, make a consensus among them about how um, uh, go through uh, this process. And I think uh, what we are going to see um, is a very trans important transformation, not from one leader to another leader, but um, most importantly, from a personal leadership to a, a corporative uh, a leadership. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Kate, uh, the United States government is coming under criticism for continuing to issue new sanctions actions uh, in the midst of this crisis. Uh, should the USG stop the uh, new sanctions actions until this crisis passes? <clears throat> I don't think it's 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 necessary to withhold new sanctions actions um, as as long as they're not um, interfering with uh, the humanitarian response or um, the the perception again that the U.S. will not uh, will not block assistance to Iran. So, for example, you know, continuing to go after Iranian proxies in Iraq who are posing a threat to, um, to, to U.S. personnel, U.S. Um, interests there, as well as undermining stability in Iraq. Um, I don't see that in any way coming into conflict with the humanitarian response. I think there's also um, a, a past record of, um, of continuing to, 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 to use sanctions as the stick on one hand while extending um, relief on the other, and you see this throughout the period of the interim agreement of the of uh, the Iran nuclear deal, and and through even implementation of the deal itself, where the Obama administration continued to um, to impose uh, non nuclear sanctions on Iran while giving relief on the other side. So I think that the idea that um, that there there needs to be uh, some sort of pause in the implementation of the sanctions themselves. Um, is false and doesn't doesn't have as, as much relation to uh, providing humanitarian assistance as something. Thank you. And now a question for me. Uh, you didn't mention the oil price collapse. What impact is that having on Iran? Uh, well, the fact is that Iran's not exporting a whole lot of oil. And so the oil price uh, collapse has not had as much impact on Iraq as it had, excuse me, on Iran as it had on, has had uh, on other oil producing countries. So I mentioned earlier the Iranian economist uh, Saeed Leilaz, and, and he is uh, quite correct in pointing out that um, Iraq's oil export revenues per person are 10 times those of Iran, and Saudi Arabia's are 20 times those of Iran. Uh, so the countries that are most affected uh, by the oil price collapse are countries that are producing a lot of, a lot of uh, oil and exporting a lot of oil, uh, and, and Iran is not one of those. 
Amir, uh, what could Iran do? What could the government of Iran do that would have the most impact on the COVID-19 uh, evolution in Iran? You're asking me how the clock works. <laughs> so there's a wide variety of uh, intervention. I think in the first, as a first step, um, uh, leadership of the country's public health efforts has to revert back to the civilian sector. Uh, the second aspect, uh, based on Iran's past history, which I've written about, Iran is has been incredibly successful uh, in the last three generations against infectious diseases and global pandemic. And one of the key reasons why Iran has been successful against pandemics is because of multilateral collaboration. In 1964, when Iran was in the grips of the El Tor cholera pandemic, it collaborated with the US Public Health Service, closely worked with the WHO, putting its own indigenous biomedical capabilities in play together with outside help to develop uh, vaccines and um, an antimicrobial approach to controlling that global scourge. Meanwhile, across the border, the Soviet Union had very much a similar approach that Iran is having to, uh, towards the COVID-19 today, which is it securitized uh, its approach to stopping uh, the El Tor pandemic, did not report numbers, put its military in charge, significantly influenced by politics. And whereas Iran largely controlled that outbreak within a matter of months after it first crossed the country's borders in 1964, the Soviet Union struggled to control the El Tor pandemic for another five years. The pandemic crossed the Soviet Union into, from the east, where it made land for around the same area where it had crossed Iran's borders, worked its way all the way to Crimea five years later. So this shows us that probably the best thing the government can do is first hand off the, uh, uh, the, the public health measures to the civilian sector, to engage with the outside world, including multilaterals, and let the amazing doctors in Iran and the amazing public health system, which is one of the best in the region, do their work. Because I think they will do a better job if they are allowed to do their work and engage with the outside world. Thank you, very interesting. Mehdi, it would appear that uh, Iran's response to the COVID-19 was in part driven by faith, this idea that, uh, uh, that faith can solve the problems. Uh, what does that say about the rationality of Iran's leaders, and what lessons should we draw from that about uh, how we can approach deterring them uh, on the nuclear front? Um. Look, um, the, the government is more ideological rather than religious, which means that um, it uses the religion for its uh, political purposes. Um, uh, the uh, government was so serious in defending its uh, policy to bring um, uh, thousands of foreigners to come and train them as a, uh, as clerics um, um, in a country that has uh, lots of problem with, uh, uh, for example, Sunni population, uh, which is, you know, one of the interesting things which happens was uh, Mulana Abdul Hamid, the uh, religious leader of uh, Sunnis in Baluchistan, who uh, 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 publicly criticized government's policy to bring Chinese uh, to Iran and train them um, as a, a clergy. Um, so um, the government, what is import important is that the government does not follow the religious logic. It follows the logic of power and justify that by uh, religion. Uh, so um, no matter what kind of decision Ayatollah Khamenei makes, 
that would be um, uh, religiously justified and uh, uh, religiously formulated. So I don't think that the government is constrained by religious uh, rules and religious um, uh, uh, um, uh, limits. Uh, on the other hand, the government is an autocratic system which which uh, uh, try to legitimize its decision in religious uh, language. Thank you. Um, Kate, and then I'd like to chime in too. Uh, what has been the impact of the transatlantic call to ease humanitarian trade with Iran? So I don't know if the if the questionnaire is referring to there was a, a statement last week signed by a number of uh, European leaders and uh, former U.S. Uh, ex experts and, and officials uh, working on sanctions issues um, calling for I think the headline was calling on the administration to ease sanctions, but in fact if you looked closely at um, what their the points in their letter. Um, this was more along the lines of calling for an expansion of the authorizations um, that the authorizations for humanitarian trade and, and more really along the lines of what I said in my remarks, looking for a more effective implementation of those existing authorizations. Um, I think that it's, it's unlikely um, that we're going to see a major change from the administration and sanctions policy. Um, and I hope it's not unlikely that we're going to see some sort of uh, statement clarifying uh, what is allowable. But the Treasury Department did issue a statement last week um, that reiterated uh, the, the exemptions that, are, that exist. And it also um, continued to ascribe, uh, as I said, a, a, a lot of risk to conducting this sort of trade. Um, there are no doubt, as Patrick mentioned before, examples that we can cite of where humanitarian, humanitarian trade has been exploited. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, the administration has already, on the one hand, uh, pushed forward the humanitarian channel and pushed forward this license allowing the central bank, despite being designated um, for supporting uh, terrorist financing uh, designated terrorist activities. Um, that they have already taken these moves because uh, there are measures in place to mitigate some of these risks and um, the benefit of allowing the much broader section of not illicit humanitarian trade to go forward um, is worthwhile. So, so I think there is space there for something, even though I am not holding my breath that we're going to see uh, much of a change at this point from the Trump administration. Well, referring to that statement that you uh, talked about, uh, I saw that as a transatlantic call to criticize the Trump administration and not a transatlantic call to ease humanitarian trade. Because if the real impact, uh, real desire is to ease humanitarian trade, then uh, then I think that the, uh, what the statement would have done was said, okay, well, here are the steps that have already been taken and let's figure out ways to make them work better. Uh, and instead, the way the statement was written was, uh, well, the Trump administration is doing nothing whatsoever and it's not being helpful and it's uh, blocking humanitarian trade. Well, look, folks, it's just not the case. I mean, as uh, as Kate mentioned, uh, it was a considerable climb down for the Trump administration to allow transactions of the Central Bank of Iran in March, having uh, just banned them uh, some months earlier. And uh, the statement about uh, the transatlantic call to ease humanitarian trade made no reference whatsoever to the repeated U.S. government statements that it would offer, tra um, it was prepared to offer assistance to Iran. Now, one can be suspicious of those U.S. offers. I am. I don't think the U.S. government is particularly well positioned to provide aid to Iran. And, uh, um, but I think that if you really wanted to get humanitarian trade into Iran, what you'd say is, okay, let's work with the State Department to identify what are the things that the State Department, that the U.S. government could do uh, to carry through on this. Um, rather than uh, this uh, uh, attitude, which was uniformly critical of the Trump administration. Uh, Amir, a question for you. Uh, you refer to Iran facing its peak problem sometime this summer. Uh, is Iran going to face a second wave after that? Um, probably, uh, you know, I suspect, and, and many analysts suspect, is Iran um, eases uh, its current social restriction measures, which you have alluded to um, earlier, uh, we, we will see, we will probably see a second wave 
of the disease uh, in terms of higher rates of mortality and uh, higher rates of morbidity within the population. Um, and there could also be, depending on what proportion of the population is infected, uh, you know, as long as the proportion of the population is under 60% or 50%, we might even see recurrent waves uh, of the disease uh, returning to Iran. So uh, I, I think we will see, you know, um, we will see a second wave or, or a second peak, certainly, uh, in, in July. Uh, latter part of June, July, or August in Iran, depending on um, what the numbers of infections currently are. So it's a question for me. Uh, the International Monetary Fund is famous for its conditions, which it attaches to its loans. Uh, what conditions would there be for uh, an IMF loan to Iran? Well, the IMF officials have gone out of their way to emphasize that this uh, new facility under which Iran has applied for funds, and uh, they are eligible for 100 percent of their quota, uh, which in this case, uh, the first year, which in, in this case is uh, um, 4.85 billion U.S. dollars. Um, the IMF officials has emphasized that there's only two conditions. One condition is that the country has to show that it's in a position to repay the loan, uh, and that's certainly the case for Iran because Iran has ample foreign exchange reserves. And second is that the country's uh, government has to pledge uh, that the funds will be used to address the problems created by the COVID-19. So that's it. They just have to pledge. They don't have to take any actions to show this. Uh, they don't have to take uh, concrete measures. They don't have to um, you know, put the funds in an escrow account, none of that stuff. They just have to pledge uh, that that's what they'll use the money for. And I assume that the Iranian authorities can do that. And in fact, <laughs> they do need money uh, to fight the virus. So um, I don't think that conditionality um, is, is, uh, is going to be that uh, tough, to put it mildly. Um, Mehdi, question for you. Uh, what do you think the U.S. government could do to better uh, expose the um, inefficiencies the Iranian government has had in responding to COVID-19 and um, the negative effects of the securitization uh, approach that it's adopted? Uh, one of the um very effective tools to uh, expose the inefficiency of the government uh, is through uh, the uh, media that um, uh, belongs to the U.S. Uh, government, especially um, uh, Voice of America. I think the media uh, would have, especially now um, after the coronavirus um, uh, uh, pandemic, and the uh, restrictions imposed on uh, people in different countries, uh, the um, efficiency of the uh, whole media has been decreased. I mean, people cannot go to work in BBC, Iran International, and so on. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, it needs special attention now uh, from uh, US government to uh, um, uh, enhance the uh, media's uh, ability to work and report about the situation in Iran, especially uh, we don't know exactly uh, what are the details of the uh, 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 Revolutionary Guard's involvement in the matter and how uh, the involvement plays role in, uh, 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 in efficiency of the health system in prevention of the virus. Kate, a question for you or anybody else who wants to chime in. Uh, could you speculate on what impact you think this crisis is going to have on Iran's longer-term relations with Russia and China? So I, it, it's been interesting um, to look at uh, how Iran has its relationship with China both um, fed into the development of the crisis um, and then has um, has has there's been a, a a rift forming between them as well politically as you've seen criticisms um, going back and forth about um, handling um, of the of the response. Um, 
I think that Iran will continue to be dependent on China in terms of trade um, and will continue to look at them as an important economic partner. Um, I don't see how uh, that would fundamentally change at this point. Um, I think that I'll let uh, Patrick, maybe if you want to respond to the to the Russian uh, side of that. I, um, I, I think I'll leave that to you. And I'll just have to say that uh, I don't know about Meti, but I have seen exactly nothing in the Iranian media about uh, uh, Russia and the COVID-19. Yeah. So uh, one last question, and then we're going to bring this to a close. And um, that's uh, for Amir. Uh, so was it purely government inefficiency, which is the reason why this hit Iran so hard? Or would Iran have been impacted pretty hard anyway? Um, this, why why yeah, was Iran hit so hard? That's actually an excellent question, because often what you get is a comparative, right? You know, Italy has done badly, you know, in terms of mortality, morbidity. Um, the United States, we're certainly seeing uh, our health systems being stressed. Uh, but Iran had a particularly rapid and elevated slope uh, in terms of the disease's transmission and growth. And, and it, it, you know, those of us who observe Iran would never argue that, that the disease would have never reached Iran or would have not had uh, would, would have not impacted the country. But if you compare Iran to its neighbors, COVID-19 made an earlier landfall and a much more rapid spread and growth in the country. And it is that slope and it is those numbers that really put the stressors on the Iranian health system. And it is there that the government is responsible uh, because early intervention could have slowed the slope. Iran's population, unlike Italy's population, is a relatively, and I use that, uh, Patrick, very carefully, especially with you on the panel, it's a relatively young population, certainly under the 60s. And uh, there, there certainly was not, uh, Iran did not have to see this level of casualties and this level of cases um, the level of cases that we saw in Iran, occurring in Iran as, as rapidly as it did over the past two months had the correct public health interventions been put in place. And what we saw is that things that now we consider as state of the art, uh, that being social distancing, limiting assembly, uh, quarantining, travel limitations, all of these were not put in place in a robust manner in Iran, which has led us to the current crisis. Um, Kate's asking you, Amir, to say something more about the supply chain issues within Iran in terms of access to and needs for certain goods for the public health intervention. Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, you know, uh, it, it, it's tough. Uh, and Kate, this is this is uh, this is more in in your lane. But uh, based on my conversations with the private sector, including the private uh, health sector that advises the Ministry of Health, um, red tape and um, uh, 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 and barriers within the system itself were an enormous problem to be able to acquire uh, supplies, uh, you know, once the government admitted that it had a pandemic in hand. Uh, one concrete example of this is alcohol, which is a base component of uh, a lot of the disinfection uh, material uh, whether it's sanitizers or larger dis disinfectant materials that are put in place in public health interventions, there was an enormous supply ready to be purchased from Germany, ready to go, but a lot of the red tape and a lot of the barriers within the Iranian system prevented this. So, so, uh, so, so the, the, the internal supply chain barriers have been a big factor in slowing down um, Iran's ability uh, to um, ramp up uh, 
its its um, uh, materials to respond to the pandemic. Very good. Well, I'd like to thank all of the uh, participants, all the speakers, and everybody listened in. And uh, we will be sending out in a few days a, a rapporteur summary of this event, and uh, you can you'll be able to find the recording of this event uh, online uh, soon. So thank you very much for participating. And if you have suggestions about other events that we should be holding, not only about Iran, but uh, other issues concerning the Middle East, uh, don't be shy about sending them along. Thanks ever so much, everybody, and goodbye.